Well, good morning, or and good afternoon, welcome and or welcome back. If you have seen this uh, this channel before, my name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte, and I have a distinct pleasure of hosting this series of conversations that we are bringing to you live. Um, this session today is uh, going to be a deep dive session number one of our Tech Trends 2000, uh, 2023 unveil. Um, for those of you who are joining us, who are rejoining us, you would know that two weeks ago, we have formally unveiled our Deloitte Tech Trends for 2023, where uh, I was joined by uh, Mike Bechtel, our global chief uh, futurist and lead orchestrator of our Tech Trends. Um, and today we are going to go into a deeper dive on our first of the six trends, Mike is going to sort of remind us on the of the te tech trends first. But the, 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 what, what I wanted to also mention is that um, this is a live session and audience members, you will have an opportunity to engage with our guests uh, using Q&A function of, of the Zoom platform, which I absolutely encourage you to do. Um, this morning and afternoon, where, depending on where you sit, or, so, or I know so, for some of you it's actually evening. Um, I'm joining. Uh, I'm joined by three of my good friends and colleagues: uh, Mike Bechtel, uh, our chief futurist, as I mentioned, a familiar face to many of you who are rejoining us. Uh, Raquel Busiano. Raquel is a novel and exponential technologies lead at Deloitte. And she was a key author of this particular trend we are going to be unpacking today. And joining us from Toronto, Canada is Michael Chase, a senior to Deloitte and our subject matter experts, all things meta and exponential. So uh, without much further ado, I would like to uh, pass the baton to Mike. Mike, if you, if you would be so kind to maybe give our audience a little bit of a just contextual co co context of where we are at with tech trends and how the conversation today fits into the tech trend series. Uh, and of course, the fact that going forward every two weeks after today, we are going to be doing a deeper dive into each one of those remaining uh, five trends. So Mike, thank you for your time. Welcome back. Over to you. Oh, goodness. Delabor, it's... um. At the risk of sounding saccharine, it's never not awesome to be with you. Like, <laughs> like no, really, like I, I never feel like I have to like remember to smile. You're on the internet. It's like no, I'm with Dolivor. Of course, I'm smiling. You are, and <laughs> um, and then it's thrice as nice because I get to jam with um my dear friend and teammate Raquel, and my new friend and teammate Michael, and so um everybody here's here's the tale of the tape, um as it were, um little less in my um, big, big head um, and, and a little bit more of, um, in this case, our, our AI generated big brain, which um, pro tip for, for those who, who either didn't hear it the first time or uh, didn't hear it, period. Uh, we actually used uh, AI generative art for the, the artwork throughout this year's Tech Trends report. And it's been interesting because while we don't have a dedicated trend about, you know, Dolly, Chat GPT, you know, uh, Mid Journey, uh, Stable Diffusion, um, uh, we, we did one better by, by walking, walking it rather than talking about it. So that said, uh, tech, trends, tech trends ain't new, right? Uh, our team here at Deloitte has been in the business of trending tech uh, for the last nearly 15 years. Uh, and I share that because uh, it, it's not a, um, this is not a trust us, we're professionals kind of an assertion, uh, it, nor is it any sort of a proof of work, you know, pat ourselves on the shoulder assertion. It's the recognition that when you see newfangled stuff for long enough, you see patterns within the patterns, right? You start to separate the art of the possible from the art of the profitable. Uh, and for those of you working in the public service sector, profitable means useful. Okay. And here's the scoop. Speed dating edition 
everything that has tended to accrete to utility in the history of IT, or, or maybe in more plainer English, everything that's been worth its weight has been a story of interfaces getting simpler, information systems getting smarter, and processing backend right, computation systems getting stronger. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes people, some of you have heard me say this maybe over the, over the last couple of weeks or months or, or years, you know, like futures, what is that snake oil? No, our job properly conceived and delivered is to inoculate you, our clients against snake oil, right? Uh, which is all to say, we tend to be able to separate weed from chaff, signal from noise around what's new based on whether or not it's driving towards this inexorable goal of simplicity, intelligence, or abundance. Now, here's the deal. Say, okay, okay, sounds good. I'm in, but what's next? Well, here's the scoop. We're going to be talking today about what's new and next in interaction. What's new and next in simpler means of connecting to digital systems. Okay. Now, in the future five sessions, right, we're going to deep dive into what's new in machine intelligence, what's new in backend processing, and then we're going to spend time on those three businessy ones, right? And by businessy, I don't mean less technical. I mean protecting the business, right? What's new on the organizational and leadership side, right? What's new on the cyber risk and trust side, and what's new on the rusty but trusty system side? But today, today is a look at what's new on interaction. Okay. Now, if we would have gotten together last year or two years ago, we would have talked about the reimagined hybrid digital workplace, a response to the pandemic. We would have talked about digital customization. Before that, intelligent interfaces. Before that, remember the internet of things, ambient computing, wearable computing? Well, this year, this year, we're talking about a concept that we've dubbed through the glass. Okay, a little bit of a nod to through the looking glass. But here's really the idea, gang. There's a wrong way to think about the M word, the metaverse. And that wrong way is to think of it as a shiny hammer being foisted upon us by one or two companies that's searching desperately for a nail, right? The wrong way to think about this stuff is to say, why on earth do I need this thing, right? Or something like it, right? Why do I, you know, it, it seems uncomfortable, seems curious. The right way to think about this is that it's a movement beyond an oversaturation of screens. Okay. The right way to think about the metaverse, or as we've been calling it, the immersive internet, or as our practice areas are calling it, unlimited reality. Right? The right way to think about this is that this isn't about a shiny new hammer. This is about the recognition that screens right? Can't keep going from something this big to something this big to something this big. And then you did it. The last thing we want is another glowing rectangle, right? And our lived environment is overfilled with them. I mean, Dalibor, Raquel, Michael, I don't know about your desks, but let me, let me do the old count, you know, I've got seven screens in here. It's like fully 15% of the space in my room. It's, to say nothing of the ESG sustainability electricity issue, it's too much, right? This screen right here is blocking a perfectly beautiful view of the woods. And so part of what our research suggests is that when we look back at 2020, 2021, 2022, 
we might giggle at all those screens. We might say, you know what? Just like we were at peak oil back before we figured renewables out for good, maybe we were at peak screen because we hadn't yet found the better way, which was to have not something like this in all of our heads, but props, right? In the next six, 12, 18 months, decent looking glasses, you know, I happen to have sunglasses here, I don't have to be sunglasses, but decent looking smart glasses that will allow us to bring our own pixels and superimpose digital information in a discerning and rights managed way into our lived environment. In short, this stuff is gonna win, not because it's fancy, but because it's simpler. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna talk for the next, you know, for the next 48 minutes with Raquel, with Michael, with Dalibor, about how this is manifesting in real businesses today, right? about where this is heading for your businesses tomorrow mm -hmm. and add some crunch to, to this high level story. I'm gonna take a breath. Dalibor, any questions, curiosities, comments or concerns before maybe I hit a couple of these quick case studies and then turn it over to my colleague, Raquel. I think that this, this fundamental concept that we are moving beyond glass is extremely important to understand that this is not about a toy that presents itself but about useful tool that actually helps our organizations and our clients and their clients clients simplify the interaction and i think if if our collective mindset moves from novelty to that simplification of interaction that's a major leap forward that will be helpful to everybody here right i mean that simplicity point can't be overstated man yeah you know Ra Ra raquel uh, I, I know you haven't had a chance to properly introduce yourself so so consider this a bit of a soft intro like well welcome aboard but Ra raquel and i are close teammates right we work on a team called novel and exponential technologies here at deloitte and we had the privilege of visiting CES, right, the Consumer Electronics Show in, in Las Vegas just three weeks ago. And Raquel, at the risk of straight up putting you on the spot, maybe you could speak a little bit to some of those 3D televisions that we're starting to see and why they stand a chance at actually converting and winning. Yeah, yeah. No, it was... Well, one, CES is fascinating for so many reasons. I mean, five days in Las Vegas is probably three days more than I like to spend in Las Vegas at any given time, but for CES, I'll do it. Um, but Mike, your point, I mean, there was so much there regarding everything from mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual re reality, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut, if you will. But what Mike was alluding to is one of the exhibits there showed... Um, a 3D experience that didn't require you to put on any glasses. So typically if you were to watch 3D, you have to put on the glasses, you know, old school, it's one lens is red, one lens is blue, different, you know, beams of light hit it. Instead, all you had to do was walk in front of the screen and the computer, the screen would have computer vision that would track your eye movements and direct different beams of light at either. Basically taking the burden of the red glass or the red lens and the blue lens and saying, you don't need to do any of the work. And what I liked about it is for so long, I feel like humans almost have to bear the cost of making changes and adopt to technology. You know, we're the ones who have to wear the glasses and the chain, right? There, and, we, and some of it is good, it's necessary. But in this particular instance, it was, it was frictionless to its core. It said, all you have to do is open your eyes. We will do the hard work for you and we will show you 3D and meet you where you're at. So I think even as an evolution of this, this idea of frictionless, inter um, frictionless interfaces, it's all about reducing the gap between humans and technology, and in some ways, decreasing the burden of humans to have to make and close that gap. And that's what I really liked about it. Mm. I literally, 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 in the proper use of the term, not the way my preteens use the term, uh, could not have said it better myself. Um, you know, Michael, 
in in that vein, I know you and I were were jamming a bit ago as to how you've seen just in the last six months this idea of immersive experiential interfaces going from talked about to all people talk about. And, and I'm wondering, you know, it, it, tell tell us more more about that that zeitgeisty change. What what's going on, and how is it starting to manifest with with your work and your clients? Sure. Um, first, I want to give you this really cool story. So I was just in London, and I went to an ABBA concert. And you're going, okay, wait. You went to an ABBA concert. ABBA's not around. They've split up. They're old. What do you mean you went to an ABBA concert? <laughs> they have built what is in essence like being inside the metaverse, inside a set of Oculus headset or whatever you want to go. This is industrial light and magic has put this together. So cutting the, their teeth on Star Wars and you know Marvel for you know, you know, low budget type of things. They've built a 141 million pound arena that's movable, transportable, that is this immersive sound and light show that brings ABBA completely to life on the stage. And I mean, you cannot tell it is not ABBA performing. They've got screens, they've got video, they've got, it, it is, it's spectacular. And I'll, I'll see if I can share one little picture here um, off of my desktop. Yes. Uh, it's not yeah. letting me get to my little picture, unfortunately. Oh, let me see if I can pull it up. No, I'll just share it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. I appreciate the the if there was ever a topic where in a picture was worth a thousand words, it's as it, it would experiential be, interfaces. It's, so it's, folks, this is well worth it's a hard, worth this is it's a hard it's a hard one. It's a hard one to pull up off of this interface. Hold on, let's see. Share screen. Here we go. Image share. Now Amazing. I'm gonna give you this as just the simple straight up. This is what that this was them coming from below and raising up into the stage in 3D. They came alive. They were spinning pianos. They were dancing. They were interacting at a completely different level. And then the entire stadium comes to life. And they're, they've got dance platforms. People are dressed to the nines. There's champagne all over the place. There's 7,000 people in this experience. And it was, it was as real as it gets. And to me, this was the, the tipping point. Like, are the Beatles coming back? Is Elvis coming back? Or where's the music industry going to take this new technology? And back to what you just said, Raquel, I didn't have a headset on. I was in the headset. I was in the experience. I was, I mean, I was blown away by this. I mean, not only was it a sound and light show extraordinaire, but there was ABBA. And it was, you could see them, feel them, you were just, yeah. They were everywhere. And that to me, just, I just went, there it is. This is, this is the future now. Yeah. And if you start to look at that and how it's relating back to our world, um, and I, I recommend you all go see ABBA Voyage in London if you're, you're there. <laughs> right. It's going right. to start touring. Yeah, you know, you can see it. It's sold out completely. I think they've now got a like gigs for San Fran coming up. And I think Vancouver in Canada. And I think they're going to start to play this thing out because I mean, it was packed and it's sold out now till it's run. I mean, granted, they have to make 141 right. million pounds back, whatever. <laughs> right. At the end of the day. Right. right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a hurdle. There's always a hurdle, but there's always a hurdle, but this was exactly what we're talking about right yeah. now. Now, when yeah. you start to translate that out, it's got all kinds of moving parts in it, but it was group experience. It wasn't me in my Oculus headset having right. that next thing. It was, it was playing to what we're talking about. Yeah, now. yeah. It, and, and so many of the objections, Michael, I think to your point, the, since, since you've used a literal pop music example, I, you know, I, I, I often use a figurative one, namely, you know, it's our, it's our birthright to dislike our kids' music, right? Like my parents thought grunge was noise. <laughs> I think my son's beats are noise. And, and so goes the circle of life. Um, but I think so too with tech, right? I, I think there was a generation of, of, of technology purists who might have thought that icons and windows were uh, a gimmickry 
Whereas uh, my generation saw it as why not? (laughs) Why not simpler, right? And so to your point, um, and to address a great question we have here in Q&A, you know, VR, right? Um, Patrick says, you know, this stuff isn't necessarily new, right? We've been talking about VR for gosh, 40 years. Well, well, here's the scoop. And, and here's, here, here's something I think worth, worth recognizing. This stuff, as with most emerging tech, turns this corner from tech to toy to tool. And you're right, 40 years ago, you know, I've been up to all things newfangled for 25 of them. And I too remember like, like VR demos where you had something three times this size wired up to a server in the basement, right? Like a Xeon. And um, if everything worked just right and only you demoed it, it would kind of sort of be immersive and interesting, right? And then a few things happened for the, for the, for the, the geeks among us. And I, and I wear that word proudly. Like that's a compliment to, to you. For the geeks among us, what we've seen is a couple things. Virtualization, thanks to cloud compute, okay, has made it such that when something is popular, we can scale elastically to support it. For those of you who remember Second Life 15 years ago, right? The problem with Second Life was you went to, if you went to that ABBA concert in Second Life, it would have crashed immediately. Totally. Because, because pre-elastic computing, it was just like, hey, check this out. It's awesome. Everybody comes on it. If, if you've ever heard of the Reddit effect, right? Like, oh, we love it. Oh, we killed it. It's like of mice and men. Lenny didn't mean to kill the <laughs> mice. Um, cloud computing and elasticity has allowed for scale. One. Two, 5G or advanced connectivity writ large is allowing for the bandwidth and critically the prioritization of the packets for this stuff to show up in multiple places, right? And then three, GPU compute, right? GPU powered compute on this thing or eventually this thing, right? Or more realistically, this thing connected to this thing over over Bluetooth. Okay, Mike, have you seen the Mojo contact lenses? Okay. Yes, but tell tell our tell our guests. So, more. so yes. that is that is AR to the next level. Now, if you think about this, now it, it runs into all kinds of levels of complications once we start talking about contact lenses. But they just two weeks ago demoed their next edition of this. We're talking contacts that are. Have you ever seen the movie Free Guy? That would augment your entire world in an interesting way. So now, if you start thinking about that, the metadata, the things that are there, the augmented experiences, the comparing and contrasting products, the getting access to information. I mean, I, I like the cool sunglasses and all, but you're now talking about being connected to a computer. Now, that technology did not exist to the point of having it, you know, reduced to that micro level. Is it, is it ready for the street? No, but with the apples pouring in in the world and the different groups coming in and the money that's going into this, you know it's only a matter of time Dude, till we're sure. connected at that level. So, so that kind of advancement, you know, to, to talk about these experiences we're talking about didn't exist. Right. I mean, you, you just couldn't put that kind of power, those kind of frame rates, that kind of change well, into that, the tech and, at that point. And, and that's it. And Raquel, you know, thinking about the, you know, as, as we turn the corner from the what to the so what, right and and michael your great example right like like this tech 40 years ago it was imaginable and 20 years ago it was demoable and i think five years ago it was pilotable yeah. economies of scale moore's law metcalf's law pick your law um this stuff is turning that corner from tech to well, toy. It's Dick, it's Dick Tracy, right? I mean, well, right, we right, were imagining right. Dick Tracy and now we're wearing yes. Dick Tracy's yeah. watch and talking. I mean, it, it, yeah, that's it. you look at those things, it's it's crazy. And right? and, and 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 yeah, and 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 for those executives among our group here, right? Leaders, business professionals and practitioners, you're thinking, yeah, 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 but this is all for fun and for horsing around and for entertainment. And and that's usually the second stop on the train. You go from tech demo to fun and, you know, immersive video games have a bigger uh, total market value right now than Hollywood. Um, You know, my son doesn't think he collects virtual baseball cards because he's never known a (laughs) physical baseball card. It's just a baseball card. And so Raquel, I guess I'd ask you, how are business folks 
starting to turn the corner from toy to, to tool? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because I, I like what you said. It's a, it's not a revolution. It's an evolution. Um, so this is just mm -hmm. the next stop on the train, if you will. And I'm going to see if I can pull up a slide handy in, in, in a second here, but I think the way that I like to think about it and that we've expressed it in the report is as we move on the next stop of the train, you can think about it as a growth driver for your business or a value driver for your business. Mm -hmm. And let me get this. Well, while Raquel calls that up, I, I, I would just say for those of you with a finance or fintech or or just a history as a as a investor um the 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 word choice is intentional think growth stocks value stocks intrinsic versus upside you know top line bottom line raquel i have yeah. offic officially bought you seven seconds to call it up go, go for thank, it <laughs> thank you usually it takes more than seven to call it right, up right, so, right. so i appreciate that um, but, but you'll see, and I'll go through the growth ones first and the value, but the way that I typically think about the growth ones is similar to how you might've thought about your web two strategy or in, you know, a web two um, allegory. I might also draw the same comparison here for the growth stocks or the growth stocks, the growth, um, the growth bubbles dimensions. Uh, the, the first way we think about it is promoters. So advertising existing offerings. So this might be akin to if you're using um, the internet as it is right now to simply advertise your business, um, you know, you can replace that ad on, you know, insert major search engine platform with a billboard in a virtual world, right? The, this is a, a means of promoting your business activities that are currently happening today. A pluser takes that a step further, um, augmenting existing offerings. And so the, 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 the web two category here might be um, restaurants who use the internet for food delivery services, right? How, how can we augment and plus our in-person experiences um, by enabling new services um, in metaverse type environments? And then the third is pioneers. So architecting new offerings entirely. And this is, this is the, the equivalent of companies during um, uh, dot com that were simply online business businesses from the beginning. There are some purely virtual metaverse oriented businesses, right? And so on the growth lens, this is all about how do we how do we increase um, engagement, activity, um, create new offerings. On the value side, on the other hand, this is where we're seeing, I'll be honest, a lot of enterprise activity today, um, tr truly more than anything. And the two, there's two use cases that stand out that encompass quite a bit. So they're pretty meaty, but the first is augmented workforce experience. So personalized collaborating learning experiences. This to me is one of the biggest use cases that I think enterprises can explore today, right now. And what it, what it can do is if you're using AR and VR to virtually train, we're seeing huge returns on this. Learners are 275% more confident in applying skills. The speed at which you can train four times faster than classrooms or uh, you know, 1.5 times faster than virtual trainings This data comes from our unlimited reality practice. But what you can do to train up your workforce, especially if you have um, workers that are operating in say um, strenuous conditions or difficult mining operations, right? That that's not the first time you want to train someone, you know, and it's also expensive. Yeah, what about right. doctors operating on patients? I mean, there's so much there. So I think this is such a big area. And then the last one is enterprise simulation. And so it's really thinking about that, um, the end to end cycle of how, you know, manufacturing product production, how we think about, um, I would think about um, uh, the movement uh, of goods, ideas, data throughout the organization. That enterprise simulation digital twin piece is also huge. And I know I'm, this is now four minutes in and I feel like I can speak for another 40 on this, but it's just so exciting because there's, uh, to your, uh, Mike, to your point, as we move from toy to tech, um, as we hit peak screen, how different companies deal with peak screen and adjust will depend on so many different factors, and there's so many different flavors to go off from here. Michael, what? It, oh, or Dalibor, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think I think uh, VR used for training is an obvious use case, and we 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 see many many organizations use that, especially for those high risk areas, right? Uh, you know, power lines and 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 medical training and so forth. Uh, 
enterprise simulation, digital twins also, I think, is uh, is something that is very, 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 um, very, very, very much present already. Yeah. I would be curious to hear any interesting, maybe use cases or client stories you would have uncovered mm -hmm. uh, that maybe touch on examples of, you know, promoters, plasters, pioneers. Are there any good client stories you could potentially share? Well, I got a few. Yeah, please. <laughs> and uh, no, I, you yeah. know it, it's inter it's interesting because that toy to tech and and where things are going. You know, everybody's you know, hooked into the Ready Player One world of what Mark Zuckerberg's trying to envision this is going to be, and we're all in headsets, and there's a dystopia that attaches to that. Right? Great. But what's happening right now in business is how do I how do I innovate and what is that next level of innovation and what is the future hold and how do I enable these new technologies so what we're seeing and I'll give you airports you think oh well, what are airports going to do in this well we had problem sets autonomous wheelchairs what are you going to do with an autonomous wheelchair is it going to go from a to b and get you to the gate what's that going to happen well it's a great idea but if you don't know how to actually operate it inside of a system and you don't know how to then take it and say, this is what it needs to do, where it needs to go, what do you do? Enter digital twins or a simulation. If I built a digital twin of an airport, and now I can understand what the customer wants, go back to human-centered design, where they're going to go, are they going to stop for books, are they going to stop for things, what, what's going to happen? Now I can guide the experience. So the airports went out and tried autonomous wheelchairs, but if someone spills a coffee in front of you, the chair stops and you're you're, you're honestly, they can't, they can't reconcile it. But with the digital twin, they can start to promote, look at who works, who gets called when something happens, where that goes. They can look at the robotics that assist it. They can look at the stop points. It, it's a complete mechanism. Now, I move that out to another smaller place, the baggage handling on the runway. IoT devices, how baggage comes together, exoskeletons, robotics, micro robotics, how those things work. Right now you're thinking, well, you're talking science fiction. No, those are actually happening today. But how do you coordinate? Them? Well, if you did take a digital twin or an enterprise simulation of that, and I can explore the weight of the digital suit, how that works, the robotics, how they come together. And then I can train and collaborate with my engineers and staff on how they're going to have an experience that I can actually prepare and, and look at all the diagnostics and analytics of that before I even make it. And once I do, then I can train against it and I can collaborate with others around the world. So that's tackling today. That's not, that's not somewhere in the future. That's bringing all of those amazing technologies that we're playing with and starting to make them work. And that comes back to your point, Mike. Speed, frames, cloud computing, how do you get there? that's enabled this and, it, and it's really how far can our imaginations go today for those reimagined experiences you know michael that i learned long ago right you you can't over over communicate you know the mission as it were and simple wins and it's always one and and to your point these things are showing up in enterprise uh, either on the growth side as raquel pointed out or the or the the value or the internal side um because sober business decision makers are finding that it's better faster cheaper stronger like all the business basics right uh, one one of the clients we talked to and and we we hit this briefly 2 weeks ago in our survey view but you know it's one of my favorites is we talked to Exelon they're, they're the United States' largest uh, electrical utility. And we talk, talked with one of their senior technology leaders, and she said, here's the deal. Doing field service on an electrical substation is hard and dangerous. And the state of the art for years and years was you'd wait for a really good weather day right? With the right humidity and the right sunlight and the right wind, you know, you wanted all your externalities managed. And then they'd fly, you know, a handful of folks out and you'd learn that you can't be near that thing with that tool, right? You, you, you can't touch that thing that way. Um, she joked, she said, 
you don't even have to touch it wrong. You can't, you could look at it the wrong way and it'll zap you. And, and we thought, whoa. And she said, you know, 10 years back, they, they moved aggressively to online learning because the promise of, of, of the traditional internet, right, was, hey, we can deliver this wherever you are. Think of the tropes of the last 10 years, right? The right place at the right time. Sure. But when it was delivered through a screen, what they started to find was that people weren't getting the muscle memory, right? That, 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 that sense of how close is too close doesn't work in a, you know, hands-on keyboard 2D sim. And so for them, it wasn't this leap of faith. It was, ha, body language <laughs> plus, right, virtual safety. And, and, and the way that she explained it, she said it was a triple win. I said, triple? You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the double bottom line. Like, like what, what's a triple? <laughs> and she said it was, it was better outcomes more affordably delivered and more safely. And, and, and so to me, that was an eye-opener back to this, this idea of unlimited reality. And Michael, you said it so well, man, limited only by imagination, right? Like what are the itches that we could stand to scratch that you know, we now can thanks to this emergent uh, hammer? Yeah, and Raquel put it really well when, when you laid out the growth pattern. If I take a, exactly what you just said, Mike, and we're dealing with like a large, let's call it global winery. Um, they've got, they've built machinery that's built by Italian designers. Okay, so something goes wrong with the elaborate machinery and they're flying the Italian designers in to fix it. Now, we can actually put a hollow lens on, have them in your ear, see the machinery in front of you, have cues and pop-ups start to move on the machinery and have the designer in your ear. They're no longer traveling. They're no, the efficiency has gone to a ridiculous degree. And at the same time, you've solved your problem like that. The, back to the sustainability of these things, to them, that was like, oh my God, like this is, this is Nirvana. So, so those use cases, back to you know dangerous equipment as Dalibor put it, or mining or where these things are starting to show up and not just chemicals is one side, but the other side is I can now, I can now fix it with someone in my ears and in my eyes. That's very different. Oh man, that guide on the side, right? I, I mean, yeah. in, in working with some, some of our US firm colleagues and, and leaders, Francis Yu, um, Aaron Aksu and company that they, they often hit that note that do you ever, you ever hear that term team of uh, me me measure twice, cut once, right? Part of the value prop with this whole immersive internet, this unlimited reality is it's cheaper to do stuff in silico than in, in the real world, right? You can measure 66 times. Heck, you can throw an AI at it and measure it 60 million times. Um, yeah. But when it's time to pour concrete, you know, that's a one-way door. And, and so it's about getting, getting stuff banged out right first in silico and then moving to physical. Raquel, you were going to say something. Sorry. No, no, I, I, I love that. And I mean, it's a little different than the... Um measure twice, cut once. But I thought you brought up an interesting point where when we think about training, there's the training that happens before and there's the training that happens after or do, during, right? And so the training before that's, you know, VR simulation, right? That's everything going through that. And what I like different than online platforms is online platforms will say, here's the scenario. How do you react? And I'll sit there thoughtfully and I'll take my time and I'll say A, B, C, or D but that's not really how I might react, right? That's not, I'm not put against the time pressures or there's not rain in my face. Like this is, yeah. I'm sitting in my nice comfy office selecting A, B, C, or D. Whereas in sim, you know, simulations, it actually says, not just Raquel, how would you react? But I'm reacting and it'll tell me if you complement that with AI, now you can start to get to more, um, more richer understandings for how we can train that up. That's before, but Mike, to your point, what about when I'm in the field now? 
how can we augment that worker experience? That way, if I need to recall information or have the training manual on the side or anything of that sort, I have that rich source of information just in time. And I think that we're gonna see a transformation both before and after that really says, listen, we, you know, there's a lots of issues happening with you know, labor shortages, um, retention policy. I mean, there's so much happening when it comes to the future of our workforce. You saw, Figuring out both of those is, is Raquel, going to- Raquel, that you, you nailed it there. And, and think about chat GPT right now. There are those with chat GPT and there's those without. <laughs> And it's going to be this new difference in the augmented workforce. Like you're, you're bang on. Like, are you going to leverage the AI and the, the VR and the AR? Are you going to bring those into your world and you're going to be that group? Or are you going to be the without group? Because it's going to, there's going to be a big disparity in that. And, and it's, going to, yeah. I, you know, you're bang on. And you're, it's going to be very relevant to business. Yeah. We, we saw, Michael, we, so remember earlier, I, I mentioned, you know, uh, this year's Deloitte Tech Trends artwork brought to you by Mechanical Painters. The, pun the punchline there is less about, whoa, check out, you know, robot painting. For us, it was more about, holy moly, our creative, talented humans who make amazing images for a living. They went through this, like, uh, uh, you know, w whether you call it the, uh, you know, uh, Kubler Ross stages of grief. You call it the the you know the the Maslow's hierarchy. They went through all the things. To your point, Michael, around we don't want robots doing our work. We don't trust robots doing our work. These robots do compelling work. How can we work with the robots to do compelling work? Yeah. Hey, we've learned best practices for engaging the new must-have tool in our creative work, and so we're already seeing this where. Um, our colleague Nitin Mittal and Tom Davenport just dropped a book yesterday called All In on AI. And we'll have another session in a couple of weeks about AI. But it was this idea that like, hey, you know, the us versus them thing with humans versus machines, Michael, you said it, man. It, it, it's a limiting and scarcity-based worldview. And, and so too, I think with immersive internet, it's we're either going to poo-poo this stuff, throw the baby out with the bathwater and miss some business growth opportunities, or we're going to say, huh, I bet I can use this to solve a problem we're solving. It's neat yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's not that the good news is we're in control. I think sometimes I think we believe technology happens to us, right? <laughs> okay. Right. I guess this is the few we're in control of how we use technology, Right. And so it's up to us to design the right processes to make sure that we think it's um, safe, equitable, you know, that it's all, all, all the things we want technology to be. But technology is not making the decisions we are, right? And so it's up to us to figure that out. And are we going to augment ourselves with that, Raquel? Like, I mean, you know, we talked, we were riffing early on, on, you know, human brain interface levels, you know, that's the book Ready Player Two. If you really go into the where this stuff is going from that world, if 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 Elon Musk and Neuralink are starting to put things in your brain and you're now connected to the internet, well, what does that mean? Is that a? I know when I ask that question to people, would you put a chip in your head if you had this ability to augment yourself at this next level? And you'll get the some people going, Woo! and they're on the roller coaster ride right away, and you'll get the other people going, not a chance. Like it's very polarizing when we start to talk about this, but that augmenting is coming. That we're talking about AR and VR; those are augmenting yourself in a different yeah. way. We've we've already proven that when you put a VR headset on, your brain changes. It actually adapts. It actually learns in real time because it thinks it's there. It understands it as reality. So your yeah. brain and your perception are just types of reality. And we all experience those realities in a very different way. So we have to be aware of that as we go forward, which is how do we use it? How do we adapt? What does this look like? What are the best use cases? How do we now play with this? And then how do we build these things out so that we accelerate the right way? Yeah. And, and Michael, to, uh, I think your, your, your point on the polarization, right? Where people are all in, where they're saying uh, absolutely not. 
I likely, I think that we'll see convergence in the future of that, mm -hmm. that we'll start to see that regression almost to the mean, because the way that I think about it, at least, you know, brain computer interfaces is it, it starts with restorative capabilities right now. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the conversation, but it'll move more towards elective enhancement. And as we kind of move along that trajectory, the polls become slow, closer to the mean, because at the end of the day, what, the reason I use PowerPoint, Excel, Word is not because um, you know I am in love with them. It's because everyone else uses them. And so, in a world where everyone else is starting to opt in towards elective enhancement, potentially now we're thinking years and years down the line. Um, at some, it's a competitive pressure. Uh, it's a societal norm. Um, and as I, I think that we'll likely see evolutions on the front of progression from restorative capability to elective enhancement, as well as a decrease in polarization and regression to the mean as society yeah. norms to these things a bit more. Uh, you, you are actually answering a number of questions we have received from the audience around, you know, adoption and fear and hesitation and, but, you know, risk of job losses and so forth. I think that what you just described now, Raquel, this, 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 um, this approach that you know technologies that will be used to you know restore and repair and then evolve into elective ad enhancements as it normalizes across the world this is probably this is this feels right and mm -hmm. I, i'm certain that similar concerns were happening you know 100 years ago when when cars started replacing horses and carriages, people oh. were saying, oh, my God, like, this is the end of the world. These machines are going to chew us and, and, and you know, it'll be the death of the civilization. But yeah, I want have... a faster horse. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, well, and, and, you know, to me, a, a lot of the we often say, you know, futurists are, are secretly historians. And, and you know, the, the, the sub quote under that, uh, good old Mark Twain, he said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. <laughs> and, 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 and here's why that's classic Samuel Clemens. Um, I remember this rhyme in the mid 90s. Right, you know, I'm 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 halfway between geek and geezer. Right, <laughs> I've seen some stuff. I try to maintain my boyish enthusiasm, but the big debate at that time was calculators in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Right, and and it, it, the the cheesy right. Usually, it ends with the bar joke of like my teacher said I wouldn't always had a calculator with me. Jokes on him, right? But 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 the the better story is, um, we began to your point raquel we began to acknowledge that that calculators right weren't a substitute for learning arithmetic primes or not primes but like primals primitives uh, the, the basics rather once you had it was an amazingly useful tool to jump to higher order stuff and i think you know people worry you know you brought up the the the, the smart contacts michael there's something interesting about the, the the skin barrier, right? Where smart glasses, ee, smart contacts, ee. but but if you think of it conceptually, we're already cyborgs, mm -hmm. right? Take this thing away from somebody for a week and see how they react. I just did it to my <laughs> ten year old. Didn't go well, <laughs> right? And and so I think in the workplace, as we think about business outcomes, it's okay. For 40 years, we've been talking about VR. Let's not think of that as a ding. Let's think of that as the recognition that for 40 years, we've imagined a world where digital and physical get along more seamlessly. We're finally ready for that close-up. Let's not squander the opportunity, right? Let's do it in service of business problems worth solving. Let's lead with need. And, and, and I think we can all stand to, if anything, right? I, as a parent, look forward to you know, my kids looking up <laughs> instead of being in here all the time. Yeah. But it, yeah, but, it, but you're, I'm sorry, go ahead. Rick. No, I, was, I Mike, your point, you know, regardless of what you call it, whether it's mixed reality, augmented reality, metaverse, VR, extended, 
the names don't matter. No matter if it's decreasing costs, if it's increasing revenue, if it's increasing employee retention and customer engagement, those are the things that I want to bet on as a business. And to your point, I mean, I, I, I think that hits that's that's the signal to noise ratio we need to strike right now, especially with so much in the media, so much conversation happening around interaction. But Michael, I'm more curious to hear what you had to say. I, I, for me, as we're as we explore all these things like digital wallets, tokens, blockchain, crypto, where these things are going, the NFTs that go into it, digital IDs, a lot of the enablers in this world, these are all things that we're linking together into beautiful platforms that you can plug into. So the risk factors start to get mitigated by the fact that we're connecting dots now in a very different way, even with us, with our alliance partners, like you take NVIDIA, like an Omniverse, like there's just amazing cloud computing and things that all get attached now that mitigate, you know, let's call it being a pioneer um, and doing that the right way gets you to that thing with, with you know reducing the fear factor understanding the technologies more you know becoming comfortable with augmentation and what those things really mean you know it's not a it's not a this or that it, it's this really blending and blurring new world that we're in and that to me is the exciting part because mm. I, every day i see a new little thing that connects in a new little way that creates this beautiful synergy that to me is is what I just love about this. It's it is really that that new compendium. I I I think that uh, the the framework you presented, uh, Raquel, the the framework that uh, is actually used within this trend, the one that breaks down the case studies into value and growth. That's very powerful. And I think that organizations ought to think about their use cases from that particular lens. And as, as a reminder, like the workforce experience, interaction enabled through this technology that is focused on helping the workforce have better learning, training experiences is certainly something that can apply across all industries, geographies, and companies. Like that's that's a that's a really simple, straightforward use case, and that could very well be the starting point that that organizations who are interested in exploring this beyond glass interaction. That's I think where a good start could be. Yeah. Then. The next logical extension could be the enterprise simulations, if of course that that if 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 that is useful. But then, on the growth front, advertise uh, like promoters, plusers, and ultimately pioneers is a great way to think. Uh, I think I think it's almost a maturity model of how to maximize involvement in and leverage off the technologies we're discussing, right? hundred percent. Delabor, it, you know, it, cliches are cliches for a reason, but this journey of a thousand steps starts with, starts with one, right? And, and I, I, and while there's no required order of operations here, um, I'm with you. People yeah. start any most businesses, not all, but most businesses start with something inside, right? You yeah. pick, pick your cliche or your frame, right? You know, drink your own champagne, eat your own dog food, whatever it is. But using this for the betterment of your employees, finding that value to convert real believers in traction, then scaling it to system wide internal use, right? Yeah. Our, our unlimited reality practice really thinks of it as, you know, there's that, there's that augmented workforce training and simulation. There's the enterprise sim, digital twins, modeling in silico, cutting twice or measuring yeah. twice, cut once. But then, yeah, the growth side, you know, 30 years ago, there were really smart people on boards of companies you've heard of who were wondering, do we need an internet strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, what's so interesting is, 
to ask when you look back feels like folly. But in fact, a lot of companies, you know, and, and I would in, in a thoughtful way, hopefully, you know, I would say that, you know, 30 years on, even, even a firm like Deloitte, right? At the end of the day, we've decided that, yeah, our internet strategy is essentially to advertise in a gorgeous and engaging way called Deloitte, right? So we're promoters. That's great, right? And, and, and I think a lot of folks feel like they have to build some metaverse resident something. No, no, no. There's plenty of time for pioneering. Just realize that you want to fish where the fishers are, you know, where the fish are. Yeah. And increasingly, there's a generation of people who are going to be hanging out in these immersive spots waiting to be engaged. So perhaps if, 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 if uh, those audience mm -hmm. members are, who are listening in are thinking, like, what do I do with this? Like, where do I start? That introspective use case around employee experience, education, training, learning, uh, supplementing face-to-face -face meetings with virtual meetings like Mike, you and I do in our next-gen CIO academies. I think that's an excellent, concrete, specific use case that every single organization could and perhaps should be piloting, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then it, what was shocking to me to learn, and of course, as you know, we, as we run our CIO Next Gen Academies, the audience are all tech executives, how few have actually experienced VR in the, in the business context, even in setting up meetings amongst colleagues, how many of them have said, oh, of course I have this set. My kid is using it for games, right? And then after they experience it firsthand, you remember the the the, inter, the, the, the reactions. Yeah, it's eye open. It's shocking. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> this actually, right? Yeah. So to yeah, me, yeah, that yeah. is the place that every organization could start. Experiential technologies need to be experienced, it, and, and and this interaction totally. zone, right? Like, no, no. If you've experienced it, no explanation will suffice. If you haven't, yes. none will do. Yeah. And, you know, I've just, imagine the business case, what's upon a time for television. Imagine it was probably typewritten on a typewriter. It was just like a, like a collection of cathode tubes that would pervade us, some milkroom of reality. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Show them a television. I'm in. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, exactly. And this, exactly. Is, this is beyond the FOMO of missing mobile and social and where this yeah. is going to go. This is back to what Raquel said, and you you iterated my evolution, right? This is yeah. Yeah. this is natural where this is going. It's just how do you harness it? How do you get on board, and how do you start playing in it? Because it's it's a freight train, and you yeah. know you just don't want it to go blowing by you. Yeah, and it and it feels like too many things are happening for this to be. You know, another oh, yeah. tech winter that's going to pass. Mm -hmm. Too many things are happening simultaneously on too many fronts that makes this real. Yeah. So the, the betting on this, I think, is a safe one. And on that front, I want to be respectful of your time. We are hitting our, our, our time. Uh, this conversation actually continues in two weeks as we unpack the AI as our trend, the trend around information, where we're going to talk about how do we learn to collaborate between our organic and inorganic colleagues. So Mike, you will be back with um, you, a few other experts in that in, in that specific domain. I would like to thank Raquel. Thank you so very much for your time. Michael, your, your, you as well. It was wonderful to hear your thoughts and, and, and get in this conversation. And for the audience, uh, two weeks from now, we'll be back unpacking our trend number two. This session has been recorded and we are going to send you a link to the raw recording. So thank you all very much and have yourselves a lovely Wednesday afternoon. All the best. Bye-bye.